Good morning, dear friend. I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning broadcast from the Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. It's Preacher Bob. We want to thank you so much for tuning into the broadcast. Pray that the Lord will bless you this morning. Uh, I always like to invite you out to the church. If you're listening and you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to come out and be a part of ours. Located on Myers Lane, just go to Food Line, turn down the street there, uh, Myers Lane, between Food Line and Dollar Store, and the church is right in front of you. 10 a.m. for Sunday school, 11 a.m. for morning worship, at 6 p.m. for evening worship. Sunday, Wednesday night Bible study is at 7 p.m. We'd love to have you come out and be a part of our church. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 16 today. If you have your Bibles and you like to read along as we read along, that's where we'll be in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 16. And it's about the Jesus' baptism. John the Baptist baptized him. Uh, he really didn't want to, said he wasn't worthy, and Jesus said he must do it. And he went, and when he, Jesus was baptized, well, he came straight way up out of the water, heavens was opened up, and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, landed on his shoulder, remained there, and God the Father spoke out of heaven in the following verse. And what a sight that must have been to have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all there together at the same time. Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Let us pray. Father, as we bow before you, Lord, thank you for the gift of this day. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word, for the opportunity to be in your house and proclaim your precious word. Father, we praise for this broadcast that you would just reach out and you would touch lives this morning, that you would heal those who are hurting, that you would lift those up who are weak and strengthen them. God, that you would just bless as only you can, that you would save the lost. And God, we pray for WLAF radio station that brings this broadcast, make it possible. My dear friend, Jim Friedman. Lord, we pray that you would ever uh, bless that radio station and all those who keep it open and bless their families. We pray for our first responders, that you would bless them and their families, for the police and firefighters and the rescue squad, the doctors and nurses, for the military and for their families. We pray for our country, that our country would turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray for this message, for the power of God upon it. Lord, for the words to say, and we'll be so very careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Christ Jesus' precious, holy, saving name we do pray, and amen. Notice the verse number 16, Jesus. Now, when you read in the Gospels about Jesus, Jesus is usually and always ministering to someone else. He's healing all manners of sickness. He is casting out demons. He's calming storms. He's preaching or teaching the word. He's ministering to others. But we find here in Matthew, there's a record of Jesus being baptized. Now, granted, we always believe now that you get baptized after you're saved. Jesus had no need of salvation. Jesus was sinless. Jesus didn't have to get saved before he got baptized, but he followed in baptism. He identified with sinners, even though he was sinless Lamb of God. He became sin on the cross of Calvary for us so that he could forgive sin. But here we find, and I just like to make this point, being baptized without being saved is useless. You get saved first, then you get baptized. And the con there's a misconception that you have to be baptized before you're saved is simply not true. you got to be saved first. Then you follow in believers' baptism as a public ex uh, record that you are trusting Jesus as your Savior, and you're now following in believers' baptism. Jesus didn't need a Savior. He was the Savior and the only Savior. 
but he followed in believer's baptism. He set an example that once we're saved, we do need to follow in baptism. But notice this. He was baptized. But you look at the word baptized in the word of God, you only find it in the New Testament. You find that he's baptized. But I notice, moving on, that once he was baptized, he was immersed. We know that to be true. But he straightway, which means immediately after he was baptized, he came up out of the water. Now, when he came up out of the water, he had been baptized by John the Baptist. He encouraged John and said, I must be baptized of you. That was part of what John's, what God the Father called John as John's ministry was. He was the forerunner of Christ. He preached there's one coming whose, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to latch it. He said there's coming one that I'll baptize with water, but he'll baptize with fire. There's coming one. He identified the Lord Jesus as Jesus came out of the Judean wilderness. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And even from his mother's womb, God named John. He gave him a ministry. And John has just now fulfilled the ministry God the Father gave to him before he was ever born, and he identified him, this is Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. He is the one that will take away the sins of the world. He's the one I've been preaching about that one day would come. I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. And when John identified him, introduced Jesus to the people that were there at the Jordan River that day, announced who he was, and then when he followed by baptizing, John's ministry began to decrease. And you'll find us shortly after that, John ends up in Herod's prison, and of course, uh, his head was cut off. But let's get back to the baptizing. Straightway, immediately he came up out of the water. That is like the, he was looking ahead, showing us the resurrection. Now, they call it the watery grave. You're baptized with him. You go down, you resurrect, but you see Jesus it set an example of a symbol that he came up out of the water, which means there's coming a day that, yes, he would go to the cross. Yes, he would shed his blood. He would lay down his life. Nobody took it. But on that third day, as the baptizing symbolizes a watery grave, he raised up straightway out of there, but he's walked. He knew that one day he would walk out of the grave, and he was showing the world. He was showing the devil. He was showing the church that as he came up out of out of that water, he would one day came up out of the grave. Because you see, salvation is is not complete without resurrection. You can be saved, but resurrection means that we're going to live forever with a glorified body in heaven. And he came up out of the water as if one day he walked up out of the grave. You see, Jesus didn't have to be saved before he was baptized because he was sinless. And it was up to John to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his commission. But we baptize, we rise, we come up out of the water, but it's so that we can live and it's so that we can serve. But... Let me move on. I want to go to this part. It's the heavens were opened up. As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he rose up out of that water. That next chain of events, heaven opened up. And that was a rare, that, but that's not the only time heaven would open up for the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember a time where he led Peter, James, and John. You see, at his baptizing, heaven opened up. He saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming down, landing on his shoulder. But the next event was that the Father, his Father, spoke out of heaven. And he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But you see, Jesus 
It's not the first time that heaven would open up for him. The Mount of Transfiguration, he has called his disciples. He had an inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He led them up the mountain. And when they got to the top, and notice this, it was the place where Jesus led them. Just like the Jordan River, that particular place is where John baptized Jesus. That's where heaven opened up. On top of the mountain, this mountaintop experience, when they got to that place, heaven opened up once again. And Peter, James, and John, they got to see something. And you see, it was John the Baptist, and it was Jesus. Heaven opened up, and God the Father spoke out of heaven. The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove out of heaven. But this time, they saw Jesus, his disciples did, in his glorified body. He was in heaven talking with Moses and Elijah. And they said, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen. Let's build a tabernacle. We'll build one for Jesus. We'll build one for Moses. We'll build one for I like the mountaintop experience. God showed them something that they had never seen. And that is this earth is not the end. There is heaven that awaits. They saw Moses who had died a natural death and was buried. And there he is in heaven. They saw Elijah who was taken up by a whirlwind, a type of the rapture. There he is in heaven. So they were learning the lesson. Whether we go by the grave, one day God's going to step out on the cloud and, and the graves are going to open up. If we're still alive and remain, will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and heaven is going to open up and the rapture is going to take us up into glory and they got to see heaven open up again that must have been something to see it would be one thing to see uh, heaven open up and hear God the Father speak and then the, the Holy Spirit come down but then again to see Jesus in his glorified state and see what's waiting for us on the other side. You see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration he showed us something and here's what we said. You see Jesus has always been until he came into a body of flesh. He had been in heaven looking down upon the earth but now this day he looked up and now he's on earth looking up into heaven because he was looking at the view of heaven that we can see you see we're on this earth and we have to look up into heaven that's where our glory comes from that's one day is going to be our home that was the heaven that we were go to one day and that's what the disciples Peter James and John learned on the Mount of Transfiguration they're standing on the earth on a mountain and they're looking up into heaven but one day dear friend and we're going to be up in heaven and we can look down. Thank God for that mountaintop experience. But Jesus can look up into heaven because that was, had been his home. He looks down uh, from heaven one day. He looked down and he looks down on his creation. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything that's in it. There's nothing that has been created that wasn't created by him. But God gave us a vision is that one day right now we look up but one day we're going to look down. This is his creation. He could see holiness. He could hear the voice of his heavenly father. He could see the third, uh, part, the third of the Godhead, the Trinity, the, heaven, uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, understand something this morning. You see, uh, at Eden, when Father, Son, and Holy Ghost said, let us make man in our likeness and our image, you had the Trinity that created man from the dust of the earth, and Jesus breathed the breath of life into the nostrils. He became a living soul, which was Adam. And But you find the Trinity is assembled once again at the baptizing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father speaking out of heaven. The Holy Spirit is on the shoulder of Jesus Christ, and the Son is just got being baptized he's still standing in the Jordan River and you understand he's showing us something Jesus knows his angels are still in heaven but Jesus let's let us uh, experience this you know prayers go up and blessings come down Jesus Jesus came down and he stood up out of the water and then heaven came down. The angels would one day come down out of heaven at the Garden of Gethsemane and minister to him whenever he was 
to be turned over to the hands of sinners when he was to accept that cup when he was about to go to the cross and pay the sin debt one day that heaven would open up again and God would send an angel down to minister unto him in the garden and now one day heaven is going to receive him back again you know when he came out of the grave and he was walked around for 40 days and he led his disciples out and he said one day I'm uh, he said and the glory cloud he stepped on it and that glory cloud took him slowly up into heaven he said go and tarry he said just go and tarry and, and said uh, then I'll the comforter I'll send and so they went into Jerusalem went into the upper room in 10 days God the Holy Spirit come but one day he knew he would ascend back up into heaven where the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove just descended out of heaven landed on his shoulders that he knew he would ascend back up into heaven. But there's something else too. As God witnessed that and as his disciples witnessed him going up on a glory cloud, one day, thank God, he's going to step out on that cloud and call us home and we're going to ascend up into heaven and that's called the rapture. The Spirit of God at the creation, the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. May I tell you that was the same spirit, the same Holy Spirit that now came in the form of a dove and was landed upon the shoulder of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says this, he saw the Spirit of God. There's another miracle. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. You can't see a spirit but yet he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. The Trinity is together in one place here upon this earth again. But here's something I'd like to point out if I could. God the Holy Spirit came down on the Jordan River at Jesus' baptism in the form of a dove quietly. Jesus saw it. John mentioned it. Luke wrote about it. But he came quietly. There was no noise it was only for the eyes of Jesus, and maybe John the Baptist saw it too as well. I believe that he did. And the Holy Spirit came just quiet as he represented a dove. A dove is, is so much different. A dove is meek. A dove is gentle. A dove, well, a dove is a bird that's not a predator bird, but is a clean bird. And he came down in the gentleness of a dove because Jesus came as a lamb. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. You see, when the Holy Spirit came on that day that he came at the baptism of Jesus, he came quietly. But when the Holy Spirit came to the church, he came in a whole nother matter. He was like a mighty rushing wind. When, the church, when he sent the Holy Spirit down as the comforter to empower the church, he came as a mighty rushing wind, but as cloven tongues of fire. You see, the Holy Spirit came in another form. The Holy Spirit came in a different way. When he came to the church on the day of Pentecost, he didn't come quiet that day. He came very loud. He announced his presence. He came and went up the stairs into a room where a hundred 20 were assembled of what were of one mind and of one accord and when he came that time he came very loudly he let the devil know he let the believers know that the Holy Spirit had come back but it was to empower the church and what God is trying to tell us is this. Just as the Holy Spirit came down at his baptism and landed and remained upon his shoulder, when we get saved, we do get the Holy Spirit. It's not a second act. It's not something that happens at a separate time. We get saved. We get sealed. We get the gift of the Holy Spirit. We get the God that he seals us to the day of redemption. And he empowers us, and he leads us, and he guides us. And the Holy Spirit came down to Jesus that day, and we get the same Holy Spirit that came in the form of a dove. We get the same Holy Spirit because there's only one Holy Spirit that showed up on the day of Pentecost. And you find that 
Well, if you go back to the first mention of a dove, you go back to the uh, book of Genesis chapter 8. And Noah, him and his, his family survived the flood. They're in the ark. The waters are receding. They, it's not safe. That It hasn't dried up yet. They can't. So he sends a raven. The raven never comes back. It's an unclean bird. He only cares about himself. But he sent a dove. And the dove came back. He knew it wasn't ready to leave the ark. He sends the dove out again. The dove comes back with an olive branch. Isn't that a miracle? An olive branch. Then once he sent the dove out the third time, you're going to find the dove didn't come back. So he knew that it was safe. You see, Jesus has become our olive branch. And Jesus is the one that goes before us. He lets us know he leads God and directs us. He lets us know we're safe. He lets us, lets us know everything that's out there. He, the Holy Spirit gives us to convict us that we need a Savior. The Holy Spirit convicts us and points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, after, just like when this world is over, Holy Spirit is going to take us up to heaven. That's where we're going to go. But just as the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and then came back and just like a roaring lion, if you will, God was his meek lamb as he came to pay the sin debt. But Jesus is coming back like a lion. Jesus is coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This world, time is running out. This world is wicked. This world, God's about to call his church home. I don't know when it's going to be, but I know that one day, thank God, it's going to happen. You see, you don't really hear the dove after Jesus' baptism. John chapter 1, and I think it's verse 32, is the last time a dove is even mentioned in the Bible. You see, there's coming a time when the door is going to close. Just as heaven was opened up on the Mount of Transfiguration and heaven opened up at the baptism of Jesus, one day heaven is going to open up again and receive the church. And then the last time that heaven opens up is at the second coming of Christ when he comes with his saints the battle of Armageddon drives, he rides through the valley of Megiddo, destroys the armies assembled to annihilate Israel, and he sets up his kingdom. You see, heaven's going to open up for one last time. What I'm trying to tell you, dear friend, you think you've got all the time in the world to get saved, you don't. Time is running out. The Spirit, salvation, the opportunity. Holy Ghost conviction that's running out. There are people that think they've got plenty of time, but let me tell you, dear friend, time is running out. You and I don't know when we'll take our last breath. You don't know when the last time, the last opportunity to get saved is going to come for us. But notice something, if you will. It lighted on him. That lighted on him, illuminated him. It point the Holy Spirit is a him. The Holy Spirit lighted upon Jesus, illuminated him because he is the only Savior. Everybody that was assembled, it, the Holy Spirit came down and lighted on Jesus alone, pointed him out. Because I need to say this: this world is trying to convince and. False preachers and false teachers are trying to convince the world there's more than one Savior. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and came to Jesus. What I'm trying to say is this, dear friend. There's not a bunch of saviors. Muhammad can't save you. Allah can't save you. Buddha can't save you. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. He is the Son of Almighty God. There's no other name given under heaven that one can be saved. There is no such thing as a whole bunch of different roads that get you to heaven. They will not. There is one road. It's the straight. It's the narrow. There's one Savior. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one name you can call on, and that's Jesus. You see it lit it on him. Well, he is the light of the world, is he not? The Bible is very specific. The gospel 
is, is simple. It's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every, the New Testament church, he's the one Savior, regardless of the denomination, whether you're Baptist or Methodist or uh, Pentecostal. It's the same Jesus. What I'm saying is this right here, the Holy Spirit will point you to Jesus and Jesus alone. The Holy Spirit will not say you can just choose your Savior. Our Savior chooses us. The source is from heaven. He identified Jesus. Did God the Father not speak out of heaven in verse number 17? My beloved Son... Jesus has a heavenly father. He mentioned his father. He said, I'm here to do my father's will. And when his father spoke out of heaven, he let everybody know, as he still does today, he has one begotten son. And he calls him in verse 17, he is my beloved son. And he makes a statement. And he says this, in whom I am. Notice the I am. I am well pleased. Can I ask you a question? Are you living for the Lord? Are you living a life every day? Do you represent the Father in a manner that he is well pleased with our life? Are you living for God every day? Do you love the Lord? Do you represent him? Do you find he lit it on him, which means he illuminated him. He pointed everybody to Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit represents grace. Jesus represents mercy, and the Holy Spirit does too. Right now, he's offering grace. He's offering mercy. But one day, mercy won't be available one day, mercy won't, won't, he won't extend mercy. You see, you can bow before him now and accept him as your Lord and your Savior. Or one day at the great white throne judgment, you'll bow before him. You will recognize and say you are the Son of God. You are the Savior. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the only Savior. Every knee shall bow, but you'll find no salvation at the great white throne judgment. I'm trying to tell you this morning as a warning, dear friend, the Bible is true. The Bible is accurate. And the Bible specifically says you better get saved while you can. Jesus is extending this olive branch. Jesus is extending salvation. <coughs> Jesus is letting you know that he came and he died upon the cross. And he came as a savior. He came as the lamb of God. He came extending salvation. But when he comes back, he's bringing judgment. And you need to get saved while you still can. We live in a time where people ignore that. They ignore salvation. They ignore hell. They think that they've got all the time in the world, but you don't. Time's running out. I don't know when he's coming back, but I know the Bible, which is true and accurate, says he is. What I'm saying to you, dear friend, is my time is running out. I'm going to ask you, if God's dealing with your heart, would you bow your head and ask God to come into your heart and save your soul? While you still got the opportunity, don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until your time has run out. Bow and get saved while you can. Thank you for your time. Have a blessed day.